Uh, Karen is a native of Michigan and went to Michigan State University for her BFA in graphic design. Graphic design. Studio art, arts Studio art, education. Design. She finished her degree at uh, Boston University in painting and did some women's study work at the University of London. Okay, I'm very excited to have Karen. She's one of the hardest working artists I know, and I hope she'll regale you with stories of uh, what I mean by saying that. Uh, but without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to the woman herself, Ms. Karen Ann Myers. So is the mic already on? Am I, is that all working right now? The mic is on, but you're going to have to speak up so that the back Okay. Can okay. So at any point I'm not talking loud enough, just let me know. I think I have a pretty good projecting voice. Uh, thank you, Jim and Kendall and the other gallery staff and interns for all of your hard work making the show, um, you know, be what it is. And it looks amazing. It's always really exciting for me to come and see my work in a room all together because I work in a really small studio and I'm only working on like one thing at a time. And so it's rare that I actually get to see like all of my work um, all up together. So uh, I am going to, uh, throughout my presentation, I, I have gone to a lot of artist talks myself and there's things that interest me and bore me um, when I'm sort of you guys and so I'm hoping that I can present a nice, just sort of variety of topics pertaining to my work to keep you all interested, because I know that some of you are standing, and I really appreciate that you are standing with me. <laughs> um, I'm gonna walk you through some of uh, my inspiration and uh, the formal qualities of my work, as well as the conceptual ideas of my work, and then the process. Uh, kind of how I make my work, because I would say those three things are equally important to me. I'm not driven to make art just uh, by one. So uh, to begin, uh, I would say that I've been painting pretty seriously for about 10 years now, and every year it's a challenge to myself to make a self-portrait. I've, so I've pretty much created a large self-portrait every, every year for the last 10 years. Uh, this is a portrait that I made in 2004 when I moved uh, to Boston from Michigan. The self-portraits are really my version of a written diary. They document you know, what I was wearing, maybe what I was thinking, um, the moods or emotions I was feeling. I think of myself as painting for uh, documentation, uh, not just sort of the world around me, but also more uh, psychologically, uh, sort of what's going on inside of me. So I really think of all of my portraits as psychological narratives, whether they are of me, which is what I'm showing now, or a painting of someone else. Each self-portrait that I make uh, every year is an opportunity for me to better understand myself, and it's really fun to go back and look at sort of what they, you know, what I, what I was thinking and what I was not only thinking, but how I was approaching making painting in that particular year. Most of the paintings that I've showed you so far are oil on canvas. The works in this exhibit are mostly oil on canvas or oil on panel. This image is actually egg tempera on panel, and I've explored a variety of different painting techniques. I think that it's really important for all artists to explore just different mediums and materials because it uh, challenges you and it makes you think about a different material in a way that you might not have. This is the first self-portrait I made when I moved to Charleston from Boston. And <coughs> it uh, is actually, it's titled Care in Apparel, and it was made in response to uh, when I was driving down from Boston to Charleston, I had seen this American Apparel advertisement with this like totally same outfit, and I thought, that's really cool. Went to American Apparel, bought the outfit, and then did a photo shoot with myself, and then this was sort of the first painting of my, you know, entering Charleston. A lot of the, the work that I do is heavily influenced by 
the, the mass media, the fashion industry, how women are portrayed within the fashion industry. And so this is an example of a response to that. This is the second self-portrait that I made in Charleston. And I, I struggled quite a bit. Like moving to Charleston was a pretty big change for me. I uh, wasn't really familiar with a lot of just like rules and etiquette and uh, ways that women should behave or not behave. It was really foreign to me. And I had, what, what brought me to Charleston was to serve as the executive director of Redux Contemporary Art Center, which is a nonprofit community center uh, that has a gallery, classrooms, and provides subsidized studio space to artists in the community. And while I was working there, I was often told by uh, board members or just other uh, leadership involved in the organization that you know people would take me more seriously if I wore lipstick, or people would take me more seriously if you know I wore this or wore that. And I was just shocked by that sort of behavior. And so this was kind of my uh, painting to to deal with that. A real culture change for me in that nobody had ever told me, you know, up until that point what I should look like or what I should wear or how I should behave. So this is my painting in response to that. Uh, this is my 2011 self-portrait. I have two sisters. I decided to include them in the self-portrait. Uh, they have made a lot of appearances in my work in the past and I think of them as you know, they're an extension of me. I'm really close with my sisters, and so it seemed appropriate to include them in my 2011 self-portrait. At this time, I was living uh, in Charleston, and I had not been home for a long time to visit with my family. Um, so I think I made this painting just because I was feeling like I missed my sisters. Uh, my sisters had, at that point, been living in Denver. So me and my sisters really hadn't been home to visit my family in a really long time. So for Christmas, I thought, I wasn't able to go home for Christmas, so I thought I would mail them, mail my parents this painting. So I gave this to them as a Christmas present, and I didn't hear back from them for months, and I just was like so upset. Like, I made this painting for you, and you're not giving me any attention. So uh, like two months went by, and my mom, uh, posted uh, this picture on Facebook, which ended up being our like 2011 Christmas card, which I just thought was really, really funny and cute. Uh, so that's my brother who's uh, left out of the painting, and then my mom and my dad. And I just, this makes me laugh because uh, they, so it's now hanging in my parents' house. So uh, that kind of brings you through some of my self-portraits. I spend a lot of time looking at other artists. I think it's really important for all artists to look at other artists for just you know ideas, inspiration. And I spend a lot of time looking at uh, David Hockney, Matisse, uh, Richard Diebenkorn, to name a few. Those three artists are really important to me. Uh, and I mostly study them for how they create space within their, within their um, paintings. I really like, this is a David Hockney painting, as, and the other two were Hockney paintings, and I really like his work from the 60s and 70s specifically, because his, the way that he incorporates uh, pattern and the space in a room and the flatness of that, but then also will render the volume of a figure, and it's so seamless. It's, it's just really, I mean, I think that he's amazing. Uh, this is my favorite painting by uh, Matisse, and I, over, over the years, as a, a way to just better understand how these you know, heroes of mine create the types of paintings that they do, I have made sort of appropriations of their paintings. So this is uh, the piano lesson by Matisse, and this is sort of my version of that painting. So using a similar color palette or similar compositional structures uh, that reference back to the Matisse, totally different subject matter. Um, at this point, I'm focusing less on the sort of isolated female within the bedroom and I'm bringing my friends into the painting. And I am sort of in the background of 
these paintings. So I made maybe around 10 paintings or spent about a year working on this series of works where I'm really kind of stealing from the artists who I look up to. Uh, this is a Richard Diebenkorn painting. And although I, I, I don't paint like Diebenkorn, I am attracted to his color palette, the, the compositions, and I've wanted, to, I've wanted to paint like Richard Diebenkorn. And you'll, you'll see as I go through the, the images in my presentation that I kind of go, I, I kind of teeter-totter back and forth between being more maybe uh, gestural and brushy like Diebenkorn to uh, more photorealistic. And I, I kind of want, I want to be both. And it's, it's been something that I've uh, sort of challenges me as I make work. So this is um, another one of those uh, large paintings where I'm in the background. And again, even though it's not necessarily um, a traditional self-portrait, I still would consider this to be a self-portrait because I think that my relationships with my friends make up a lot of who I am. This is uh, the Diebenkorn painting that influenced this. So sort of stealing his model poses. And as, as this series progressed, I started to just dissolve out of the painting. So I'm supposed to be the blob on the right-hand side. And, I'm and you know, with these paintings, I'm playing around with Richard Diebenkorn's color palettes, the poses of the figures, and really a lot of other painting techniques that the Bay Area figurative painters were using. The patterns in the figures uh, start to dissolve into each other. And this is the Diebenkorn painting that um, I got the pose idea for uh, this painting. If you guys have any questions in the middle, feel free to ask. So <clears throat> this painting is sort of marks uh, a bit of a shift in my work. I discover the aerial perspective, uh, which is significant. And also at this time, I lost like, the love of my life. I had been dating this guy for a really long time, and he cheated on me, and it was very traumatic. And I, I started making all these paintings of, the, of our relationship. So because of my, my broken heart, my paintings became more about detachment, isolation, solitude, abandonment. And it was a better, you know, these, these paintings were a way for me to kind of heal from that whole experience. This painting is significant because it, it represents another shift in the style of my work. Um, at this point, I begin to fall in love with Alex Katz. And if, if you're not familiar with Alex Katz, he's fabulous. This is um, uh, two aquatints by the artist, and I just love the color, the, the, the really simple minimalistic treatment of the flesh, and the attention to color, shadows, composition. And I start to think, you know, why, why take all this time trying to you know, render volume? You know, I think that at this point, I start to shift towards a more uh, flattened environment, and the paintings become a lot more about color. So I started to, so this is, um, these are some of the paintings that are inspired by Alex Katz, and I started to experiment with just not really painting the figure at all, and painting everything around the figure, and the figure might not be an actual like skin tone. So formally, I'm studying Hockney, Diebenkorn, Matisse, Alex Katz, but uh, conceptually, I start to shift towards a world where the, the viewer is maybe entering 
more than before uh, the psychological world of the female figures within the paintings. Also at this time, things start to get really weird. My mom comes and visits me. These are, uh, in, this is when I'm living in Boston. My mom visits me and she drops off all these childhood photographs that I had never seen. And so I'm going through them and I find all these just amazingly hilarious childhood photographs that I'm determined to make fit with this other thing that I'm exploring. So I start to juxtapose the childhood imagery with uh, more images from my like adult life. So it's my sister and I on the right hand side and she has her finger up her nose. I don't know if you guys can see that from there. It's called nose picker. And I was sort of thinking, you know, could that, you know, sort of what sort of uh, dialogue is happening by, you know, her finger is up her nose, but then the other woman has the finger on the lip. And, you know, I don't really have, I'm just sort of playing and I don't really have a, a plan per se. It's just, I'm interested in seeing like what happens when I put my childhood clashed with my more adult life. I start to play with clashing patterns, uh, not sort of what, you, uh, not traditional skin colors. I'm really not painting the skin. And this is again, sort of a childhood photograph. And the childhood photographs are meaningful and significant to me because I have a personal story attached to them. You guys don't because you didn't grow up with me. So you don't know maybe the significance <coughs> behind the, the childhood photographs. So in the end, I don't know that these ended up being like very successful because it was hard, you know, people's, uh, the viewers' interpretations were incredibly varied. For example, uh, this painting is entitled Just One More Fish. My father is a fisherman on Lake Michigan and we spent a lot of time out on the boat. And I do like fishing, but I don't like fishing, you know, 12 hours a day for every day. It gets really, you know, that's not fun. And so my sister and I would be out on the boat and we, you know, like, kind of like child labor and a little, a little bit because, you know, he would make us drive the boat so he could be fishing and be like, Dad, we want to go home, we want to go home. And he's like, just one more fish, just one more fish. And, you know, a hundred fish later, we're like maybe thinking about turning back home. So that's like my story behind this painting. But then I would get crazy interpretations like, oh, that's your dad, and then that woman is cheating, or your mom is cheating on your dad with this other guy, and it's just like none of that was actually happening. So, but I did enjoy the, I did enjoy the variety of the stories. Uh, this is one of the last paintings in the childhood photograph series, and uh, this one, was a more just sort of a way for me to reminisce on just childhood memories. This painting, I think, is the last painting that had something to do with the, the ex-boyfriend. Um, bear with me, the story is a little bit weird and crazy, I guess. So this, this painting is um, I found a, six, a, a photograph of myself when I was six. I was waiting for the, the school bus, which is why I have a backpack. And when I was that age, I had gone to Six Flags and got a stuffed animal monkey, which I slept with every night for like way too long. And while I was dating this guy who was significant to me, we swapped stuffed animals. He had my monkey and then I got his alligator. We dated, we had each other stuffed animals, we broke up and then he had to give me my monkey back, which was, like really traumatic for me because I was, you know, like a young woman dealing with a breakup and not, that's hard, that's hard to do. And so I ended up having a burning ceremony with my roommates and we like burned the monkey in the driveway. Then years later, like maybe, well, like a few years later, I then made a painting about that. So this is the, the maybe the, the end of the healing where I make a painting of the age when I received the monkey doing the activity of sort of the burning, you know, the burning of the monkey. So that kind of put a rest to that. Ironically, uh, uh, just last year, or maybe it was two years ago, 
a local photographer in Charleston, uh, Sully Sullivan, came across this painting and uh, wanted to do a photo shoot uh, based on the painting. And I thought, okay, that's weird. I've kind of like closed that door, but okay, let's reopen it. So we uh, did a photo shoot of like recreating the, the scene. So it's like this just never ending um, healing process. So, and I think he did a very good job of recreating the painting. So here's the painting again. And to make it kind of come full circle, I do feel like I need to make, maybe for my 2014 painting, self-portrait, actually like make a photograph off of Sully's, um, make a painting off of Sully's photograph. Do you think that's a good idea? Should I do that? It is a cigarette. <laughs> I did not smoke cigarettes when I was six. <laughs> I did smoke cigarettes for a long time, but I do not smoke cigarettes anymore. Uh, in 2008, I was fortunate to see Kahinde Wiley's exhibit at Deutsch Projects, which just totally blew my mind. He is such a fabulous painter. I think that he's exploring uh, really similar ideas as I am um, in his, you know, in his world, these are giant paintings. I mean, as you can see, just from the, the people standing in front of these. And for, uh, I've read in a, some articles that Kahinde is, he's, his work is about the investigation of power. And like me, even though he's not painting, this is not a painting of him, he still would consider this to be a self-portrait. Kahinde Wiley is very interested in the arguments surrounding identity, gender, sexuality, and I was invited to have a solo show in Los Angeles in 2010, and I had just seen this work of Kahinde's, and I just was, you know, so, moved by it that it really changed my work quite a bit. So I thought about him as I was working on paintings for a show that I had at Luis de Jesus Gallery in Los Angeles. So I felt like from him, my paintings got bigger, they got bolder, they got more colorful, they became um, more sexually charged. And I think that like Kahinde, you know, I'm trying to just better understand myself and more specifically, you know, what does it mean to be a young woman in contemporary society? And more specifically, you know, what does it mean to be a young blonde woman in 2013 or 2010 when this painting was made? And I would say while while I am painting women who are strong and confident in their sexuality, I like the duality of the sort of the psychological nature of the woman that she might be strong and confident, but she at the same time, you know, their, the paintings might also offer a glimpse of confusion or doubt. My, <laughs> so my paintings are, this, the, the, sort of these works that I'm showing you, these works are really influenced by what I call the cult of beauty in contemporary mass media. These are really inspired by fashion, photo shoots, uh, fashion advertising, the way that women are portrayed within, you know, when you pick up Vogue magazine. And, you know, how are my, my the central figures in my paintings, how are they affected by that? The aerial perspective was a real, sort of a real discovery for me because I mentioned that I, you know, the, the artists who inspire me have this interesting blend of flatness and volume. And I was always sort of criticized in school and then even after school that, you know, my, my paintings lacked depth. Well, I wasn't really aiming for depth in the work. I really, I actually like the flat end environments. And so by shooting um, images from the aerial perspective, that eliminated a lot of depth problems. So that was, 
just a huge discovery. So with these works, um, they uh, almost all the work that I have uh, shown you so far, it's their photo reference works. I take uh, photographs of uh, my friends in uh, actually in uh, my bedroom. Uh, these, these paintings, the rooms represented in the paintings don't actually exist. They are a collage of many different reference materials. So I typically will take, you know, around 2,000 photographs of, you know, her when she came over, you know, we took 2,000 photographs. And the finished painting ends up being sort of a composite image, because it might be that I like her hand in this photo and her foot in this photo and her, you know, facial expression in this other photo. I go shopping a lot and buy really great rugs and quilts and duvet covers and photograph them and then I return them because I don't need to own all of that. <laughs> One day I dream of having uh, like a giant closet like um, Cindy Sherman, you know, if you've ever uh, seen a picture or video of her studio. She has, you know, like a whole cabinet of noses, a whole cabinet of, you know, wigs. You know, I want like a whole closet of rugs and a whole closet of, you know, just all the, all the props that are in my studios. But for now, I just have to purchase and return. And I'm waiting for the day when <coughs> I'm not allowed to return things anymore. Because I think that that happens. Okay. I think that there's a limit. <laughs> So because these paintings are of rooms that don't actually exist, I have this wonderful opportunity to create you know, any number of rooms that hold objects that are significant to me. Um, you know, they're, they're, they're fantasy rooms. They hold objects that are significant to me or important to me or mark uh, a time. So this has Netflix in it. So, you know, in 20 years, you know, maybe Netflix won't exist anymore. And so the, the Netflix is significant to the painting. It marks a time period. While I'm composing the paintings, because again, I'm collaging many different reference materials together, I try to create a conversation between the pattern and the figure. So, for example, in this painting, sort of the V of the bedding just goes right into the V of her underwear. So there's a conversation that's happening. I enjoy combining, you know, very flattened, you know, no depth in the, in the painting with the more rendered model. So in 2008, I saw Takashi Murakami's retrospective at the LA MOCA. And this was also sort of a huge, this had a huge impact on my studio. In the galleries, he had designed his own wallpaper and had his paintings and sculptures situated right in front of his wallpaper, which was brilliant to me. And from this, I decided that I wanted to design my own wallpaper and you know, imagine a day where you know, the whole wall, floor to ceiling, will have my wallpaper and then my paintings on top just to add another sort of layer of chaos, really. So I began designing uh, these wallpapers. They haven't been realized yet fully as floor to ceiling wallpaper, but they exist currently as just, uh, you know, individual objects behind glass. And these are all here so you can uh, see them. But for those of you who have not had a chance to look at the show yet, um, this is a, a detail of the work. I always know that somebody hasn't really looked quite hard enough at these if they don't start, you know, giggling or like walking away and telling their friend to go and look and point. So I have a lot of fun with these. The, this is the first series of wallpapers that I've designed. They're two color, uh, hand pulled screen prints. And these are really simply, you know, explorations of color and taking pleasure in lush materials and, you know, beautiful designs. Here's a detail of that one. So the first three, those were made in 2010. In 2011, I discovered gradients 
And uh, those are the two that are um, hanging on that wall. And up until that point, I feel like what's funny, everything that I'm doing right now in my work, at one point I was anti. Like I was anti gradients, anti uh, painting uh, realistically, and it's kind of like what I'm doing now. I, I felt like, and here's the detail of that. Um, it was, so I'm like finally, I feel like I'm now am just embracing like who I, I am supposed to be as an artist. And this is uh, this year, these are the wallpapers that I've created this year and they are on that wall, which is purple and that is my favorite color and Jim didn't know that. So, thank you Jim. <laughs> uh, these I'm taking to another level in that I'm adding this really gaudy decorative frame. So with these, I'm really um, exploring different color palettes. I love Joseph Elber's, and I, I'm sorry that I didn't include any images of Joseph Elber's work in here, but he's um, an important artist to me in his color combinations and just color interactions, um, something that is inspiring to me. So I think it's really important for artists to work in different materials because you learn something that you wouldn't have learned necessarily in the medium that you're maybe more skilled at. And the paintings are, you know, they're essentially collages and I make a lot of actual collages. So these are a cut paper and marker on panel. This is an image of my studio with a very large decorative paper collection. I think Micheline Thomas is maybe the last artist that I'll show you. She has also been a huge inspiration to me in not only the subject matter of her work, but also uh, the way that she approaches painting. She, like me, also collages and the finished painting is, you know, a collage. It's of a space that didn't actually exist. And that's me in front of one of her paintings. I was so excited. I had that image in this slideshow and I just finally got to see it in person. So I was so, I was like, I have to swap out that image with one of me in it. And it also gives a sense of scale. I mean, they're huge paintings. They are not just paint, they have glitter and enamel and rhinestones on them. I think there's four collages in this exhibit. This is one of them. Um, but the, I'll show you some more examples. The collages are a way to work out color combinations before I paint, uh, work out compositions before I paint, Painting is very tedious. I am not the kind of person that just like starts on a blank canvas. I do a ton of planning uh, via collage. And I've worked, I've really worked with collage for as long as I've painted. The collages are meant to be uh, decorative. They're investigations of color, homages to Alex Katz perhaps, and ways to explore textures and forms. You know, taking pleasure in lush materials. This is a really good example of just how the works on paper have begun to influence my paintings and having these uh, clashing patterns. I, I'm often criticized, you know, how people come up to me and say like, those patterns look awful next to each other. And I like that kind of when I get that, that feedback, I enjoy, putting patterns together that you probably wouldn't. Because again, these rooms, they just don't exist. So, you know, although I would live in a room that looked like that, I think that would be fun. <coughs> I'm also often criticized for <coughs> objectifying women. And that's not my goal. And I'm very sort of sensitive to that observation. I, I do not think that I'm objectifying women. I also don't really believe in the idea that uh, sexual images of women promote um, violence to women. I think that my paintings focus more on 
the uh, psychological and sexual issues from a female perspective, and I think that that's something that uh, maybe differentiates me from others. They are about the power of female sexuality, and I don't attempt in my paintings to define like all that that women are, because I don't think that that's actually possible to do with one painting. So, you know, kind of going back to the to the beginning of my talk, the you know the paintings are my sort of exploration of myself. I'm trying to better understand myself and myself in this in this world. The paintings are about vulnerability, decoration, sens sensuality, texture. You know, all of these things fascinate me and attract me. I think something else that uh, is you know, perhaps unique in that all the, all the women in my paintings are women that I know personally and I have uh, relationships uh, with them. They're um, my friends, they're my colleagues, they're my mentors. And I hope that my paintings portray the, the dualities of female psycho psych uh, psychology and sexuality. The women in my paintings are strong, independent, complex, and it's, it's really hard and impossible for me to speak about everyone that sees my paintings. Uh, what I've found is that most people project themselves into, uh, the, into most figurative work. For example, I'll have somebody look at this painting and they'll say, oh, she's so confident. You know, a minute goes by. Another person, oh, she's so... Um, you know, distressed or vulnerable, and it's like the same painting. And I enjoy the variety of interpretations. To, to, more, to, to better emphasize that sort of duality, I've started to make diptychs so that I don't have to try to do it all in just one painting. And at this point, I'm also becoming a lot more interested in the repetition of angles and mimicking the, the pose of the model to the actual blanket on the bed. So I'll actually position you know, the model's legs to mimic the diagonals of the triangles, for example. The paintings often include objects that are significant to me, as I mentioned. And this has actually been really uh, challenging because I'm always worried that by putting uh, one object in the painting, it might totally change the narrative, like having a title of a book or, um, you know, objects can give the painting new meanings that maybe I don't intend. And so a lot of times the, the objects that I choose might just be like not charged at, in any way, like a lamp or a chair or a bag. The Afghan blankets and quilts that I've been depicting in the paintings have been also really interesting. It's become this entry point for people that I never anticipated, that uh, people who probably wouldn't have been interested in like figurative works uh, all of a sudden are like, I want to look at your painting because I want to look at that blanket. And I really, I really like that. I really like the idea that somebody is looking at the painting and they, they say, I'm conflicted. You know, you've painted this really beautiful woman, but then you've also painted this really beautiful rug, and I kind of want to look at the rug more, so I'm like really torn. And I like the, I sort of like the anxiety of that. So the next, uh, the next few images, I'm going to focus on process. Uh, I'm, you know, process is a huge part of what motivates me to make work. You know, I've talked about, you know, I'm, in, I'm inspired by color, I'm inspired by, you know, female psychology, but I'm, you know, as much as I'm interested in those things, I'm also just interested in holding a brush and feeling, you know, paint glide across canvas. The, the paintings happen in layers, so I paint indirectly. The most areas have at least three layers of paint uh, on any part. In the first layer, I, and I guess even before all of this, you know, I've taken a ton of photographs, I've made a collage, and 
after I've done all of that pre-planning, then I get to this. So the first layer is really just basic like colors. The second layer starts to establish a value. And then the third layer, I'll start to finish all of, you know, do all of the refined details. A lot of people ask, like, how, how do I draw these really intricate patterns? And they take a very long time. Um, so I use, you know, ruler, and I use, uh, currently I'm using permapaque markers, which are uh, opaque pigment pens. It's kind of like gouache in a marker. And I really draw the whole composition out in marker even before I begin painting. I'm gonna walk you really from start to finish on uh, this painting. So the first layer is all marker. I'm a planner, as I mentioned, and I pre-mix all of my colors. So these are colors that represent uh, the bed. So I I'm putting the, the first layer onto this painting. The skin starts to go in. This, is, this was my palette for this area of her, of her skin. And although I like to plan as much as possible, it doesn't, I still have to make decisions on the surface. So at, when I was at this point in the painting, I decided that that rug had to go. It was a bad rug. We needed a different rug. The color of the wall, not, not right. And so wiped out, you sanded off the rug, new wall color, and started painting another, a different rug into the painting. And you can see uh, the palette used for that par part of the rug. So at this point, the second layer of the skin is going on. So you, her face and her chest have the second layer. Everything else is just the first layer of her skin. And that was the palette used. Second layer on her legs. and then the, the finished details of the skin. I'll walk you through uh, two more paintings, how they were made. So first layer, permapake marker, line drawing. I, don't, I mean, I kind of, I've kind of set myself up to be a little bit paint by number, numbers. And I actually will make a key for myself or a guide as just similarly to a paint by numbers. So here I'm drawing all of the lines for the stripes. I made a sort of a visual guide for different values and where they would go so that at the top of that painting would be a value one, what I've sort of established as value one for all the colors. And that painting is on that wall. Um, so you can see it in person. So you can see uh, like a seven step value for the green stripes, a seven step value for the red and the blue stripes. And so at this point, the background is done, and I'm going into her skin. So this was the palette for uh, her face and her chest, and then the rest of her torso, detail, and then finished. And this is the last painting I'll show you. Uh, I just finished this painting a couple weeks ago. And I'm sort of going back a little bit to some of those paintings I was making in 2008 where I had multiple people within the painting. So I'm sort of, you know, moving away from the isolated woman and bringing friends into that painting. Uh, this is also the biggest painting I've made to date. Uh, this is 10 feet wide by seven feet tall. A little image of my studio. I couldn't use a ruler for this one because rulers just aren't 10 feet wide. So I had, you know, measuring it out with a tape measure. 
that's the line drawing. And the line drawing alone took like two weeks just to, to get that out. I work, uh, I, I aim for working 50 hours a week in my studio. I do have another full-time job, and so that's really obviously not an easy thing to do. I just got a, a punch clock. I'm really obsessed with time. I have a, a punch clock outside of my studio, and I clock in and I clock out. And at the end of the week, I add up all my hours, and I, you know, I scold myself if I haven't reached my goal for that week. Uh, at the, you know, because I have another job, I, at the beginning of the week, I think, okay, you know, I have all of these things going. If I'm going to reach, you know, 50 hours in the studio this week, where do those hours have to, like, when do I have to be in the studio working to achieve that goal? And so time management is, is huge for me. Uh, this painting took, uh, this was the first painting that I was able to have the, the punch clock, so I actually know, you know, to the minute how many hours I spent on this painting. Up until then, it was always just sort of a guesstimate. Like, I always just guessed that the paintings took like 200 to 300 hours. Uh, this painting took 536 hours, which um, was, so it took me about, at 40 hours a week, it took about uh, three months to paint. So it was, um, I went and celebrated after I finished it. <laughs> had a very fancy dinner, because I had been living in a, it was pretty much my whole summer. This is what I was doing. I was like in this cave of my studio working on this thing. So at this point, this is the underpainting. The second layers are starting to go down. Details. So as you can see, I'm sort of, I'm embracing my love of just kind of going into it, very intricate details. Adding the second figure was definitely a challenge because of scale, making sure that one figure wasn't like much larger or much smaller than the other posed a new challenge for me. Also with this painting, I have become more interested in uh, light and the shapes of light shadows. And so here's the, the finished image of that. Actually, I lied, there's one more image. It only makes sense, and this painting is here, but it only makes sense to sort of finish the talk with a self-portrait. And this is my 2013 self-portrait. I uh, kind of, I haven't been home to Michigan in a very long time, so this is about my sadness of not being home, I guess. But Jim is from Michigan, so I'm kind of like in Michigan right now. So, <laughs> uh, and I'll take questions now. Yes. Yeah, I would say it's, I mean, I certainly have taken a ton of figure, you know, I've taken um, a ton of drawing classes. And so I have never, outside of school, I haven't continued to work from life because that hasn't been um, sort of a priority for me. The, the goal of my painting really has been a more flattened environment. And so working from, sort of, well, and there's a ton of, um, because I'm working from aerial perspective, it would be hard to do that from, from life, of course. But yes, I have taken you know, a ton of figure drawing classes, and I think that it's important to have that as a foundation. I don't think I would be able to paint if I hadn't done any, I wouldn't be able to paint these paintings if I hadn't done any studies from life. Uh, I'm, not con I'm, I'm not currently making paintings or drawings from life, but I probably should. Uh, I'll confess, uh, I don't like to draw. I know that that's probably really bad advice and maybe all the faculty in here can put earmuffs on, <laughs> but <laughs> I don't like drawing materials. I don't like to touch 
uh, charcoal or graphite. I have like a thing with my hands being dry, and so I don't like, uh, I can't do ceramics or anything with plaster or uh, anything with graphite and charcoal because I don't like it when my hands are dry. So I think of um, my equivalent to studying the figure is through photography. So I really think of, uh, you know, most, you, you know, you think of painting being attached to drawing, but for me, it's really photography is attached to painting um, for, for me now. Yes? So, um, before you showed the, uh, the, the whole slideshow, I had some time and I looked at the paintings and I looked at the paintings before I looked at the, uh, I don't know what you call it, the design. The wallpapers? The wallpapers, that's it. Uh, and I was struck by, when I looked at it, this is more of a comment than a question, I was struck by how they did not seem sexual to me and yet I recognized that they could. Yeah. So, scantily clad, lots of underwear, cozies in bedrooms, this kind of thing, like, uh, it, it occurred to me some people might interpret this as sexual, but it didn't seem that way to me, it seemed intimate. That's great. It seemed private. But then, <laughs> when the colleague in our group told me about this, she said, look closer, and I looked at them, oh, <laughs> okay, and then some of the other paintings that you showed, so much more clearly of a sexual nature. So, at least from my perspective, I actually think this is kind of cool that you can portray this in, in multiple in multiple ways about, and sometimes there's a sexual component, but not always, even though some people might take it. So I, I appreciate that as well. Well, I really like that interpretation, because I do, you know, the goal is that there would be sort of a variety. And because these are so rooted in self-portraiture, you know, I've, I've, I've selected the bedroom as a place of exploration because the bedroom is my, it's my favorite place. Um, but then it's also, you know, <clears throat> I mean, I think that probably for most people in the room, that's like the only place that you have where you can be alone. You know, you live on, you're on campus, you probably have, you know, housemates. Um, but if you have a roommate, then you don't have a place by yourself. But the, the bedroom is significant in, in that way, and then the bedroom is also significant because for, for most people, that's also, they have ownership of that space, you know, ownership of the decor in that room. You know, if you have, you know, if you're married, you know, that's, the equivalent might be like the man cave. You know, the woman doesn't allow the, the man to put his stuff in the bedroom, and the woman gets the, the bedroom to put all her stuff in. So the, the bedroom, is, you know, it's a place where like sexual activities take place, but it's also a place where a lot of other things take place. And I like that you see everything perhaps in the bedroom. So, thank you. Other questions? Yes. I, I mean, I kind of, I kind of hate that question a little bit, I'm sorry. But, because I think, like, haven't we all been painting since we were, like, one, right? Um, but you're probably asking, like, when did I seriously begin painting? I would say, I mean, I decided, I've really never known a time where I wasn't an artist. Like, I was, like, the art kid in high school, and I, I would say that I decided to choose, like, art as a career in, in high school. But I knew that that wouldn't be like a way to make like a living. So I ended up going to uh, undergraduate school for, I actually first went to school for chemistry and I thought I'll be a pharmacist, this is great, I'll work nine to five, I'll make a lot of money, and then I can just paint nights and weekends, which is actually like what I'm doing now. Uh, but then I had an internship in a pharmacy and it was incredibly boring. And I could not, like, working eight hours a day in the pharmacy was going to kill me. So I switched my major to uh, studio art and with an emphasis on graphic design because I thought I can be a graphic designer and graphic designers make a lot of money because I'm trying to think, like, how can I support myself? Um, I'm not supporting myself on my paintings. And I, uh, I think most, most artists, it's not, it's not an easy uh, thing to do. I, I don't know how many artists in the world are able to support themselves on their artwork, maybe 1%. Um, 
but I sort of quickly learned that I needed to have an arts-related career to support myself. So I, I work at the College of Charleston. I have, um, I'm the associate director at the Halsey Institute, and it's been wonderful. I actually find that I love having a job where I like interact with people and I facilitate opportunities for other artists. Um, I think you know Jim is kind of the same way. You know he is an artist, but he's also working in the gallery and gets to meet people like me, even though we already had met. Um, but other artists, you can meet artists that he had not met before, and I I've found that I love working in organizations where I can you know make opportunities for other artists and that fuels my work. Jim. Um, one of the reasons I like you is in so much here is that you're one of the hardest working artists that I know. Right? It's in terms of shoulder to shoulder, I think we're very most days of the week. You, you work tremendously hard. Where does that come from? Where do you, where do you think, where do you, you've had time to think about this. Oh gosh, I don't, I really, you know, <laughs> Well, I've eliminated all things that take time. Like, I don't have a car, uh, so I don't drive. Um, I did rent a car to get here. Um, I have a driver's license, but I don't drive, so that's, and I choose to live in a place where I can walk to work. I live a mile away from my job. So think about how many hours a week you're in a car. I have those hours uh, devoted towards painting. Um, my boyfriend does my laundry and cooks for me and cleans for me. <laughs> so that's another way that I've created time. And I, I'm trying to think of the other things that suck time away. Well, we can like, phrase that a little narrower. You want to do this. Yes. You want to do this so badly that you've eliminated all these things. Yes. Life. And I resonate with that. I understand that completely. Um, do you ever want to do other things? I don't. <laughs> I really don't. I mean, I actually, I mean, I think that I have some, like, psychological problem where if I'm idle, I start to have a panic attack. And so I have to be doing something. And people always say, like, how can you just sit there and paint this pattern for, you know, a hundred hours? Um, and the answer, you know, all of the little, uh, this pattern in the back of this, that's made up of a bunch of little hearts. I, I can't remember how many hours the background took, but I could not think of anything else that I would rather do um, after I get off of my, my day job. So then I come home, I put uh, an audiobook on or NPR or um, like one of my favorite bands and just zone out. It is my meditation, it is my, it's sort of my time for relaxation. Of course, you know, there, like, not all aspects of my painting are relaxing. There's areas that are very stressful, like painting the skin is really stressful, and uh, deciding color palettes can be really stressful, but actually, like, just executing the pattern, I cannot think of anything I would rather do. And so it's, it's a compulsion. It's like a disorder, um, but in a, I, I mean, I love it. Yes. Um, I was wondering, like, all the models seem to be like a certain age and body type. Mm -hmm. What's your criteria for choosing them? Like, what are they doing? Yeah, they're all friends of mine. Um, they're all people in sort of my social circle, and the age is is because they're they're my age or near my age. And as, you know, as I continue to age, the, you know, I'm a young woman, so it's only appropriate that the, paint, the women in my paintings would be uh, young women. I, you know, I'm often criticized for not having like a range of body types, and that's something that like I'm aware of and even sort of self-conscious of. And the, the, the best answer that I have for that is the, the paintings are about things that I am attracted to. I am attracted to these women, I am attracted to these patterns, I am attracted to the colors, and so it's, you know, I'm taking pleasure in just surrounding myself in these sort of lush materials. But as I continue to age and as, you know, I gain new experiences in my life, 
like I have no idea what my paintings are going to look like in 10 years, and it's it's kind of scary to me, but it'll be it'll be it'll be fun. Other questions? Yes. Well, it would take. Um, I guess what I'm torn about is there are tons of like screen printing wallpaper companies that could do it for you, and. Uh, it would take a facility. It would take a facility to, to do them. I'm really particular in that I would have to make them, and so I would need to have access to a facility where that can be done. And there's uh, a residency it, up in Philadelphia uh, called the Fabric Workshop. I think that that's right. And I really would love to go there and, and make them. But I'm kind of just, I haven't been like actively pursuing it, I'm sort of waiting for the moment where I can take like a month away and go and print the wallpaper. Would you then sell it? I, see, that's, the, I, I don't know. I, there's all these like, because a lot of people say like, I don't want to commercialize it. So I want it to be accessible, but there's like a fine line for me that I'm not like, I'm not trying to make a lot of money off of the wallpaper. And so I, the, like the quality of the wallpaper is really important to me, so I would have to make like make it myself. So I don't know yet. Do you want some? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll make some for you. <laughs> Karen, you have a, a light drawing class that has to exit. If you're in the light drawing class, feel free to get up and leave. We're going to take continue to take questions. If you're like really, really shy and don't want to ask a question at the opening, go to my website and you can take down my email address and you can email me your question. So. I do have on my website, um, I started a blog. Everybody was saying like, oh, you need a blog, you need a blog, and I, I just didn't really want a blog. But I finally got into having a blog, and I, I actually really like it because it's forced me to document my works, like the process. Like all the process photographs that I've showed you today are a result of my having to blog. And so I have tons of just like how I make my paintings and inspiration behind my paintings on my blog. So I think there were some questions over there. Yeah. In the red shirt, red dress. Oh. Do you feel like Charleston influences your art at all? Say that again? Do you feel like Charleston influences your art? Do I what? Feel like Charleston influences your Oh, Charleston. Um, yes, I do. I do think that Charleston has been influencing my work because the, <clears throat> let's see if I can find this. My work was heading in a direction that ended up having to take a detour because, well, I was basically wanting to go in this direction uh, with my work, having just a lot more sexually charged uh, paintings. And what brought me to Charleston was to be the director of a nonprofit. And I ended up making a decision that I should make, basically make my, kind of censor myself a little bit and make 
ta tamer paintings than I wanted to because of my uh, position in Charleston. Uh, in addition to that, you know, I, you know, I moved to the South where I'm introduced to all of these sort of like rules and regulations for how women should act and behave. And so that kind of fed into something that I was already maybe subconsciously interested in, but hadn't really uh, fully explored because growing up in, in, mid, in the Midwest and then moving to Boston, you could, you could just be whoever you wanted to be. And I don't remember ever feeling pressure about what to wear. And so I became a lot more aware of how, like the pressures uh, surrounding like young women that I hadn't really had been exposed to as much. So certainly Charleston, it fed my work, but then it also stifled my work a little bit too. Um, in, in both, I think, uh, good ways. So in the end, I mean, I think that moving to Charleston was uh, this really great thing that has happened to me. Moving to the south, too. There was a few other questions in the back. No? Oh. I might have imagined it, but I noticed on maybe some of the textures and the cloths that it seemed like you were letting the weave of the fabric help it a little bit. I was curious if you don't if you're not really careful about lining up the weave of the canvas when you stretch it so that it's nice and straight and goes along with the geometric patterns that you have? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Uh, some of these paintings are less smooth than others, and I was utilizing the tooth of the canvas and as a, sort of as a way to create uh, interesting texture. And the sort of the exactness of the fabric is just dumb luck. It's, it wasn't sort of conscious. Most of these surfaces are, are, were not stretched by me. So I didn't have control in uh, the weave. Most of them are uh, pre-made uh, stretchers from the art store locally. But <clears throat> lately, like this is the most recent painting in the, in the exhibit. The works in here, really um, range from 2010 to 2013. And you'll notice how the surfaces become more smooth or slick. You know, I'm almost eliminating the texture of the canvas. And then they also become just a lot more intricate and a lot more uh, detailed. I do. I use uh, Elkid based medium uh, with my paint. So when, uh, when I paint like the first layer, it's totally dry before the second layer goes on top. So I, I do not work wet on wet. And I do not uh, mix on the canvas either. All of the mixing happens on my palette. And the, the painting is uh, a sort of a combination of transparent colors where you can actually sort of the end result, especially in the skin, the skin is three transparent layers atop each other to get, you know, this, you know the more of, a, of the look of skin and, you know, our skin is made up of layers. Um, and then other areas like the rugs or the quilts or the, the textiles are usually painted with more of an opaque paint, so the layers underneath are not as important. But uh, Elkid-based medium is used in everything, and that also kind of gives the paint this sort of enamel quality that I like. Thank you very much. Guys,